Good Sunday morning. Grace and peace to all. Thank you for your attendance at the virtual session of the Geneva class for Stevens Valley Church. We are continuing, coming to the close of our study of the Gospel of John. As a matter of fact, today we will look at the last words that John himself wrote, and then we'll look at next week, Lord willing, the epilogue. I'll explain why the different uh, concepts about uh, authorship. But for now, just to review, we, John spent about half of his gospel dealing with the last week of Jesus, of course, focusing upon the atonement. And we looked at uh, his upper room discourse at the time of the Passover. We looked at his uh, arrest, uh, at his trials, uh, his crucifixion, his death, uh, his burial, his resurrection. And now today we come to the appearances of Christ, particularly uh, the appearance to 10 disciples, and then a week later uh, to 11, and the 11th one being Thomas. Again, thank you for being with us, and uh, I do pray always that you are blessed and that God receives the glory. So we turn to our study. Christ's appearances, the last part of John chapter 20. So let's look at the text now. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now, we often talk about the seven last words of Jesus uh, spoken from the cross, and, and oftentimes uh, study that at the time of, of Easter. We did that at Stevens Valley last Easter on Good Friday. And uh, yet, uh, Dr. Boyce points out, the seven last words of Jesus really occurred after his resurrection. Now, that's not to disparage those very important words that occurred on the cross. But there are some things that Jesus said after his resurrection that are recorded in the book of John. And there are seven of these things. First of all, uh, and you might have noticed this from the reading, Peace be with you. Second, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Third, receive the Holy Spirit. Four, stop doubting and believe. Five, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Six, feed my sheep. Seven, follow me. Today we're going to look at the first five of these seven and the remaining two, Lord willing, next week. 
First, Jesus says, peace be with you, or in Hebrew, shalom. That was a familiar greeting, but it had different and weighted meaning that Jesus attached to it, and I think the apostles would understand that. So the reading, on the evening of that day, that memorable day, the day of the resurrection, same day, on the, the evening of that day, the first day of the week, by the way, Jews accounted uh, the days of the week based on the Sabbath. So this really is the first after the Sabbath, which would be our Sunday. The doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Now, Sunday, this first day of the week, as you all know, became the Christian day of worship or the Christian Sabbath. And people often ask, why did the Christians change the holy day, the Sabbath, from Saturday to Sunday? I think that's rather easy to understand. When we look at the Sabbath, as recorded in the book of Genesis, and by the way, the Sabbath was instituted in the Garden of Eden. It did uh, occur in as the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. It was incorporated into that, but it began at the time of creation, and it began to commemorate the creation. As you remember, God labored six days to create the entire universe, six days. And then on the seventh day, he rested. And, and resting in this context doesn't just mean keep may take a nap. It means to sit down and, and contemplate the fact that a work had been accomplished to the person's satisfaction. Now, as far as God is concerned, he was satisfied with his creation. And so he rested to commemorate that. And from that time on, Israelites were told, you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because six days God created the world and the seventh day he rested. So it commemorated the successful work of Christ in the creation of the universe. Now we come to this day, the evening of that day, as you see above. That day was the day in which Christ was raised from the dead. And by that, God communicated that he had accepted the atonement of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, that God has declared him to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So we've seen that Christ died on the cross, of course, and paid the price for our sin. But when, Christ, when God raised him from the dead, that was a, a, an open declaration that he had accepted the atonement. Now, in one sense, the creation of the material universe was a type pointing to the antitype of the creation of the spiritual universe, which is reigned over by the king, who is Jesus Christ. So, of course, when we compare the two, the type being the material world and the antitype being the spiritual creation, we'd have to say the spiritual creation is of greater importance. And therefore, the Christians realize this, and they change the day of worship to commemorate the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, we don't know why they met. The meeting agenda that they had is unknown. We would think about a worship service. Did they have a worship service such as we have with a call to worship and the reading of scripture and singing of songs and prayer and some type of sermon? That's possible. But rather, I think... If we, we consider what, what has happened uh, on this day, various appearances of Christ, various of these disciples, these people, the women coming together and, and telling about Christ's resurrection, they probably were simply comparing these accounts and trying to figure out the order and the significance of all of this. They hadn't expected it, remember? Comes as a surprise. So that probably is what they are doing, considering now what are they going, going to do from this point forward? Now, John says that the doors were locked. We do not know whether they met in that same upper room where they had the Passover meal and where Christ delivered the upper room discourse to them or somewhere else. That isn't indicated. The doors being locked is. And the reason for it is stated the disciples were afraid of the Jews. Of course, the Sanhedrin had put out an announcement that anyone following Christ would be excommunicated and 
excommunication meant to be a social outcast, to lose all kinds of privileges. It was a terrible and disgraceful situation. And of course, that would be followed by persecution. Now that Christ was gone from the earth, uh, and they thought he would, was gone permanently, now they would perhaps turn their attention to his disciples. So they were afraid. Now, Calvin comments that that may indicate weakness of faith on their part and the need of courage. I tend to agree with him. They were clearly, it was fear. They were afraid of the Jews. And, and Jesus will say, do not be afraid. Perfect uh, love casts out fear. But this is before the full empowerment of the spirit. And as we go through the rest of this study today, you'll see that that's going to be one of the problems that will be dealt with, that the spirit is going to give uh, these disciples more faith and more courage. Now, uh, we see that Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. People have speculated on how he came. Did he just open the door and walk in? Or perhaps uh, did he just walk through the wall into the room? John doesn't say. He just was there. One moment he wasn't there, and the next moment he was there. Very much like, if you recall, our study of the resurrection, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. She walked into the tomb. Jesus was not there. She walked into the tomb. At some point, she turned around and looked out of the tomb, back where she came from, and there was Jesus whom she mistook for a gardener at first. So I think the same situation. He was not there, and then he was there. He stood among them. And he said to them, peace be with you. Now, a moment ago, I said that this was more and meant more to the disciples than simply a greeting. And it was a traditional greeting. But to say peace to them would imply peace with God, because their sins are taken away. Uh, and now they have a re new relationship with God. It's what Paul talks about uh, when he discusses reconciliation, that we were enemies of God. And because of Christ's atonement, we become friends with God and we are reconciled to God. So we have peace with God. But also it's peace from God. God gives peace to the heart and soul of his disciples. As Paul wrote, that uh, we have uh, received this uh, peace th that can guard uh, our hearts and minds, and we should let that peace of God rule in our hearts. Now, here's Matthew Henry's comment. See the condescension of our Lord Jesus. The gates of heaven were ready to be opened to him, and there he might have been in the midst of the adorations of a world of angels. Yet, for the benefit of his church, he lingered on earth and visited the little private meetings of his poor disciples and is in the midst of them. He saluted them all in a friendly manner, as he had done before, and he said, peace be unto you. This was no vain repetition, but significant of the abundant and assured peace which Christ gives and of the continuance of his blessings upon his people. For if they fail not, but are new every morning, new every meeting. And John continues and says, uh, when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. You know, there are times when disciples realized that he was holy and they were afraid, but now that fear is gone. They were glad because they're seeing that he has come back from a situation of being dead he was dead, and now he is alive, and that caused them great gladness. His body was there. Now, it's a real physical body. He's not a ghost. Luke will record that he says, uh, I'm not a spirit, not a ghost. For a ghost doesn't have bones and, and, and flesh, as you see me. So it's a real physical body. His, his wounds were visible in his hands, in his side, also in his feet. The hands and side are mentioned here but they could be touched. And the effect was to produce gladness in the disciples. The appearance now is to 10 of the disciples. There may have been others, not among the 12 original, but others gathered there. We don't know that, but we do know the 10 were there. 
And we do know that one of the disciples was absent. And that person who was absent was Thomas. Why was he absent? We don't know. Now, the appearances to the disciples on this occasion and a week later will be just some of the infallible proofs Luke talks about in the book of Acts, infallible proofs that show indeed that Christ has been raised from the dead. So the second word after the resurrection, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You know, that's the great commission in John. People have looked at John's gospel and said, well, we don't find the great commission. And we, we do, here it is. The, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also record the Great Commission, each of them somewhat differently, but all of them saying the same thing, and this is saying the same thing as well. And, and if we look at it, it's very simple. Peace be with you, he said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. John Calvin thinks that this was their installation in office, which was then activated at the day of Pentecost, but installed at this time into their office. But notice how he phrases it here, and it's only this way in the Gospel of John. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now, we've noted before uh, this idea of the metric, that the metric, the, the relationship of God the Father to God the Son, is to be replicated in our relationship to Christ and in our relationship to each other. For instance, you remember, Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so you are to love one another. There's the, the measure of our love, which is really setting the bar very high. Now, here's the same type of uh, statement. It's the same idea of a metric, of a process, actually. Father sent me, I'm sending you, but sending you as I was sent. And that's what we need to think about here, because that becomes the example to follow. And we ask the question, how did the father send the son? Well, first of all, in humility. He was born as a baby. He was not of wealthy family heritage. Uh, he, he was born to an unwed mother uh, who was a virgin. Uh, he grew up as a boy following the uh, skills of his uh, stepfather, Joseph, became a craftsman. And uh, he was just a very simple person. Second point, a man in likeness as a man. Paul talked about that, uh, that uh, he, he put aside and emptied himself of the glory that he had with the father and uh, became a servant in likeness as a man. Isaiah will comment on that. When we look at him, Isaiah said there's nothing particularly noteworthy about him in his, in his face, no beauty that we should desire him. And thirdly, he was sent, Jesus was sent on a saving mission. As the angel told Mary, you're going to give birth to this child and he will save his people from their sins. He came to seek and to save the lost. And lastly, he came with the authority to do that, the authority from God. That's a point that John in the gospel makes over and over again. Jesus saying that he was sent and he was sent uh, with the authority to do something and that is to save his people. Now, that's the way Christ was sent. We are sent in the same way, even as, so am I sending you? Well, look at it, in humility. We're not going out as potentates and great powerful people, rulers, politicians. We're just going as simple people, pastors, elders, teachers, Ordinary Christians sharing the gospel with their friends and their family. And, and we are just people. But we are on a saving mission. Just as Christ was, just as the apostles were. We are on a saving mission in, in our churches and in our relationship with our fellow man. And as Christ had the authority to do what he did, and as the apostles then had the authority to do what they did, we have the authority to teach the gospel, to share the gospel. So we come to the third saying of Christ, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this reception of the Spirit 
interesting because we, we think of Pentecost as the time of the reception of the Spirit. And yet they are to receive the Spirit at this point. And in one sense, the Spirit had been with them all along. But uh, there is a, a distinction here in, in what is happening. Uh, Calvin said it was the inauguration into their office. I'm going to suggest that this reception deals with enabling them to fulfill their mission. And the reception at Pentecost then goes further, relates to the beginning of the church, the beginning of that mission, putting it into practice, the activation of it by the enabling power of the Spirit. Now, I skipped the first point on the slide. I want to go back to it and talk about the idea of Spirit, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, a person, yes, but described as the Spirit. In Greek, the word spirit is pneuma. We get our word pneumatic from that, or pneumonia. Uh, and the Hebrew word is ruach. Both mean spirit and both mean breath. When the Greeks wanted to talk about breath, they would use pneuma. When they want to talk about spirit, they use pneuma. Hebrews want to talk about spirit. Ruach, I want to talk about breath, Ruach, same thing, you see that. So when Jesus breathes on them, that is effectively the symbol of the Spirit. And it reminds us of creation again. And it's a fulfillment of the creation. As, as God created this material universe, now we see the creation of the spiritual world. And at both times, it's with the Holy Spirit. At both times, it's with breath. Recall in Genesis 1 that the Spirit of God hovered above the face of the waters. That's the, the, the breath of God. And this breath of God, this Spirit of God, brought order out of chaos. And then, in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That interesting detail. You see, the spirit or the breath of God brought life. Think of order. Think of life. Now, at this time, there are, as we saw before, just 10 of the apostles. Obviously, Judas is dead at this time, and for, for some reason, Thomas is not there. And there may have been others. We do not know. And the last point I want to call to your attention on this slide, Christ is appointing them to an office. Christ never appoints to an office anyone without providing to them the ability to perform that office. That's true of the apostles. That's true of us. So we ought to ask the question, what would the Spirit do for the apostles and for us? Well, let's look. The Spirit would work faith in them. Create faith, increase faith. John 3. Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom. Except you're born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The spirit brings life. The spirit brings faith. And the spirit, of course, would give them courage to stand up to the trials they were about to face, not to fear. It would enable them to understand the gospel and, of course, to proclaim it as well. Paul will write to the Corinthians and say, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Neither can he understand them, for they're spiritually discerned. So the understanding of the gospel comes from the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit would enable them and us to proclaim the gospel. 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul will say that these spiritual things I speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. Now, the difference, and you might ask at this point, what's the difference between the apostles and us in regard to this? Well, the apostles revealed truth. We do not, because the truth has been revealed by the apostles. Jude would write, the faith has been once and for all delivered to the saints. So we don't reveal, but we still have the same gospel to preach that they preached. Now, going on down the list, the Spirit would give them comfort in trials. Paul discusses that at great length in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 
the Holy Spirit would be a seal, a guarantee, an assurance of their salvation and their relation to God. Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.30, Holy Spirit is our seal, also in Colossians 2.20. It would assure, he would assure believers of their forgiveness and unbelievers of their sin. Now, there is no place in Scripture that gives us a more complete uh, accounting of what the Spirit will do for us uh, than in Romans chapter 8. So I want us to turn to that, but before doing so, look at this last point, bring life and order, and watch it as we go through Romans 8. Now, this is not the whole chapter. I'm not proposing to read all of it. What I've done is to select portions that talk about what the Spirit accomplishes in our lives. Now, remember, Paul is writing to Christians. He's not writing to fellow apostles. He's writing to Christians, to people like you and me. So this would apply to us. And I want you to watch the references to bringing order out of chaos to the references of life. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know how to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. <clears throat> now, the fourth word here, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The Roman church has an interesting uh, and I, an erroneous interpretation of this. They believe that the apostles were simply given power, carte blanche, uh, to say to a person, your sins are forgiven, your sins are withheld, or not forgiven, and no forgiveness to you. That's not what the apostles did. But they go on to say that the apostles' office continues in the office of bishop. In other words, that bishops are the successors of the apostles. Therefore, that bishops have this same power to forgive whosoever sins they wish or to withhold forgiveness from anybody. That is not what the apostles did. That's not what bishops do. That's not what we do. What the apostles were to do is to pronounce forgiveness of sins based on the gospel. When the gospel is preached, and Christ is believed upon, those who believe in him have their sins forgiven, and the apostles would announce that to them and assure them of that. In that sense, they send away sins. The word, by the way, is afete. That means to send away or dismiss. And the particular form of it here in the aorist is afintai. They are sent away. The result is from fulfilling this mission of preaching the gospel, 
The result is the forgiveness of sins when people believe the gospel. Now, I want you to note the succession here, the, the logical order of it. Jesus began by proclaiming peace. And I said it's more than just the greeting, shalom. Uh, it, it's a very meaningful uh, proclamation to them of peace. And out of this peace in their hearts and this peace with God, they are sent as Christ sent them. They are sent out. We are sent out. As, as God sent the Christ, and this sending is by the enabling of the Spirit. The Spirit enables us to preach the gospel, and the result is those who believe the gospel have dismissal of their sins or retention of sin if they refuse to believe. So there's the order, a definite uh, logical order to it. So for the disciples, for the apostles, or for anyone who teaches the good news of the gospel, for those who believe it, there is the dismissal of sin and the forgiveness of sin. Those who do not believe it will not have their sins forgiven. Now we move on as John continues the narrative. And he says, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas went from the depths of unbelief to the heights of faith. I think you can see this from this reading. I will not believe. But that's a, in line with the pattern of Thomas thinking. You recall when Jesus said that he was going away and that uh, they would seek him but not find him. But he says, my, in my father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you? Uh, and I go to prepare a place for you. And uh, you know the way. And Thomas said, and watch the unbelief in this. Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, Jesus very patiently answers him. Thomas and us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you recall the time that uh, Jesus was going to go back from uh, Galilee into Judea, specifically to Bethany, to uh, raise Lazarus from the dead. And Thomas's very pessimistic comment was, well, let's go with him, that we can die with him, reflecting this same lack of belief. So at this point, all the witnesses, everything that they said, John telling about the grave clothes and, and Peter t telling about appearances and Mary Magdalene talking about appearances. He's encountered these. And now in, in this meeting with the 10, they are encountering, uh, they are uh, telling him about the resurrection of Christ. And he will not believe it. He's still an unbeliever. He is in the depths of unbelief. And I want you to notice verse 25 for a moment. So the other disciples told him, that is not in Eris, which is the simple past. Like they just simply told him once. This is imperfect. Imperfect tense in the Greek means a continual action. So what is going on here? The disciples told him over and over again, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. No, I don't believe it. Thomas, we have seen the Lord. We have. And one by one, they're telling their experiences. And every time he's saying no, no. And they continue to try to persuade him that Christ indeed has arisen. They're trying to convince him. He's not going to be convinced. He demands empirical proof. He demands that they meet his criterion. He says very plainly, I will not believe unless I can put my hands into, and touch his wounds in his, in his hands and in his side. This is my standard. Otherwise, forget it. I'm not going to believe. Now, this is a very dramatic statement. It's very coarse and unreasonable. Of course, I will not believe unless my demands are met. What's going on in this man's mind? Well, obviously, he's had a problem with unbelief. We've looked at that. But as far as this particular claim that he's hearing, that Christ is raised from the dead, he may have thought the others are simply credulous. You guys, are you want to believe it so much that you're just imagining that Christ was raised from the dead. Uh, you, you're taking things much too quickly. You're gullible. Now, his demands also might reflect a sense of superiority, of his superiority. Uh, you are just like children. 
believing in Santa Claus, so to speak. And I, an adult with a reasoning mind, are not going to just believe something unless it is absolutely proven to me. Now, there is an importance, there is an advantage, there's a reason for this passage being there. Because Thomas has probably the same kind of skepticism that people do today. People who are not going to believe unless absolutely beyond doubt convinced. I remember one time being in Europe and one of our students who was along, was walking with me, I think we were, we were in Paris and we we're talking about faith in Christ. And he said, you know, it would just be great if Jesus would appear and, and he'd be there. The point is he did. Now they might think it's too good to be true. Maybe there's some kind of mistake but I'm not going to believe unless I actually not only can see him, but touch him. And Christ acceded to his demands. He gave him what he asked for. And in giving him what he asked for, he's giving that to us as well. So I think we can say with Thomas, he was indeed an elect child of God. He was fallen into sin, of course. But we're going to, I think we'd have to say that when Jesus gave in to his demands, that was a sign of his love for Thomas. And in a way, it's a sign of his love for us that he would provide this particular example. Now, I said Thomas goes from the depths of unbelief to the very heights of faith. And his is the first affirmation and the highest profession that Jesus is God. Well, Mary Magdalene confesses him as Lord, but look what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now in calling him Lord, the Greek word for Lord is kurios, Hebrew is Adonai, that is a ruler, one who has authority, one who should be obeyed. But in calling him God, Greek word being theos, Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah, that means a divine one. It means the creator of all things. It means the self-existent one. It means the holy one, God. And he came to believe it. Now, some have said the very presence of Christ, even without his touching him, convinced him, but certainly if he touched him, he would. Linsky writes, by thus dealing as he does with Thomas, meeting him on Thomas' own ground, he is dealing with all doubt and disbelief in his resurrection in all time to come, closing the mouth of every disbeliever in all future time. We thus really have reason to thank this disbelieving disciple for what the Lord did with his disbelief, converting it into the completed faith. I think that's an excellent quotation and it shows the importance that this appearance and this belief in Thomas can have for anyone who studies the word of God. And so Jesus said to him, be not faithless, but believing. Actually, he would say, be not unbelieving, but believing because John didn't use the word faith. But when Jesus says, do not be faithless or do not be unbelieving, he recognized the unbelief of Thomas. And now what Thomas needed to do, because God, Christ has given him the basis of faith, everything he needs. And now he needs to take that faith and put it in Christ, to believe in Christ, just as we do. Faith is a gift given to us by the Holy Spirit, given to us by God. Now, we put that faith in Christ when we trust in him. Now, maybe he didn't touch Jesus' wounds. Maybe the presence of Christ was enough. But it certainly sufficed. And his slowness to believe should be an encouragement to us. One other thing about faith, and I recognize again that John doesn't use the term, but faith is belief. But I use the word faith here because people talk about faith. You read this in the media, talk about politicians or about uh, sh people in the show business, um, business people who will say, my faith is so important to me. I have faith. That says nothing. Faith in what? Faith in myself? 
faith in doctors, faith in the government, faith in the economy. No, <laughs> faith itself is not a quantity that is uh, measurable. It has to be faith in Christ if we're talking about salvation. And now I want to call to your attention what Dr. Boyce said. Now, he uses the word faith, but understand, he believes. He's talking about faith in Christ. So he said, the world is disbelieving. And it remains so unless God himself brings faith, faith in Christ, out of non-faith, just as he's able to bring life out of death or the whole of creation out of nothing. But of course, that is precisely what God does. He not only creates and loves and dies that those whom he has made but have fallen into sin might be redeemed. He also leads them to faith in Christ, thereby producing in them that which they could never produce in themselves. And then the final word, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, to believe without such empirical testimony that Thomas demanded indicates a greater blessedness, and it shows more strongly the working of the spirit in the heart and mind of man. This incident with Thomas, then, becomes a part of the scriptural basis of faith for you and me, for others. True, Jesus conveys to Thomas that he had received a special blessing from the Lord, by Jesus appearing to him physically. But Thomas needs to understand, as we need to understand, that it is a greater blessing for those who believe without seeing him in the flesh, as Thomas did. That's the point I hope the student who was walking with me in Paris that day realizes. Same way the Gentile. They'd never seen Christ, but they would receive the gospel and they would believe it. Peter talks about that. Whom not having seen, yet you believe in him and you love him. That is salvation. And then John's thesis. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is saying, there's sufficient evidence in my gospel Although Jesus did much, much more, many other things, said many th more words that are not included, but I have given you everything you need to know to believe in Christ. And next week, we come to the epilogue and the conclusion of John's gospel. Again, thank you for being a part of our study for today. Uh, it's a thrilling study. Uh, I hope you've been blessed by it. I can give no better benediction than the words of John. Truly, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name.